And the third presentation uh, on hosting services over V6 is going to be Matt Ryanzak from the Aaron staff. Thanks, Richard. We're gonna we're gonna do uh, comments and questions uh, right after the last presentation here. Okay. Okay, so hi, I'm Matt Ryzak. I'm the network operations manager at, at Aaron, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit about how we implemented IPv6. Um, we started really in 2002, um, which you see as a timeline, though we didn't put anything in production until 2003. We really started slow, and I think probably the biggest lesson you can take from this presentation is. You can start really small and practice, basically. Um, once you get comfortable, your feet get wet, you can jump in and, and start doing it in a more w widespread way. So we started in 2002 and implemented in 2003 with, with a, a single T1 from Sprint. They had an experimental V6 network. We set this up. Um, it was really, really kind of backyard homegrown. I mean, we used a Linux router, had a Sangoma card in it. We actually used a Linux firewall at first, but then we discovered that at the time Linux didn't support stateful um, firewall packet filtering on, on IPv6. So we switched to OpenBSD, which worked great. Um, set up some Linux boxes to host our website, um, do DNS, FTP. We actually deployed things on different host names for a while, um, especially for the website, because we did not want to DOS our, our customers, um, and we weren't sure that we could get it to work. It took about six months and we felt comfortable and we, we did make www.aaron.net a quad A. Uh, this was a completely segregated network though. So it did not touch any V4 boxes at all. We, we kind of had a back door to do provisioning and to do content loads and stuff like that. Uh, but it was basically a V6 only network um, with some V4 addresses for management. Uh, we saw a lot of issues with this network. Um, Path MTU discovery issue was probably the biggest one. On the Sprint network at the time, there was a lot of tunneling, and a lot of customers just could not get to us, or we couldn't get to them. That coupled with routing issues, the, the V6 routing table at the time was not very stable. Uh, it was constantly changing. You'd find people in other parts of the world, Europe or Asia, that they had no path to us at all. They would die somewhere over the ocean or somewhere else, or they would end up in loops in Tokyo. Um, Tokyo was a common theme at the time. Lots of packets went through Tokyo and never came back, or you would go from you know, a, a network in New York through Tokyo to come down to Washington to hit our servers. It was uh, very interesting, and interesting to troubleshoot. In 2004, we started a WorldCom network. Uh, this was at Equinix. This time we used a router. It was still T1, um, but we kept basically the same architecture otherwise. Uh, had pretty much all the same problems too. Uh, a lot of path MTU discovery issues. I think this is, had to do with the fact that there was just a lot of tunnels in the way. And for some reason, the uh, Pathium discovery, Path MTU discovery just doesn't seem to work very well. We see that to this day. We had a customer about three weeks ago that couldn't send mail to us, and it turned out that their upstream gave them V6 over the last mile via tunnel, lowering our MTU on the mail server fixed the issue. So we still see that to this day. In 2006, we got rid of the WorldCom circuit and switched to the Equisix IX. This was, I think it was in beta at the time, so we were maybe one of their first customers. Um, and this gave us an opportunity to not only get fast V6 transit, but also to peer with people. Um, again, the service was basically the same. Um, open BSD firewall, same web servers, um, segregated networks, some dual stack, but really separate from our production network. And I think that's an important thing at the time. We were still afraid that V6 was gonna break our really important stuff that was on V4. And it wasn't until 2008 that we really embraced V6. And we started to dual stack everything. We actually built out completely new networks and started dual stacking our web server, our DNS servers, our FTP servers, tried to make an effort to bring every service that Aaron offered into, v into the V6 world. Uh, this was a really big step for us, but it turned out to work really well. Um, I think all of the practice that we had with these smaller networks really paid off. We had learned a lot of lessons about how to make things work, how to configure our servers, how to do provisioning, how to proxy some of our older services. You know, who is, for instance, to this day, 
still runs on a proxy. Um, the, the daemon that was written years ago, it doesn't support IPv6. So we, we use some tools in front of that to enable v6 support. And it works really well. Um, for the most part, people, they don't even notice. And some people use it quite heavily. Um, I know Google, for instance. They like our v6 um, Whoa service. We also do all of our meeting networks um, on v6. And we, I think this is one of my favorite parts, really, is we get to be really experimental on, on the meeting networks. At, at Aaron, not counting the joint meetings with Nanog, we started dual, dual stacking our networks in 2005. I think the Orlando meeting, if anyone was there, was the first network where we offered IPv6. And typically the way we've done this is we get v4 from a sponsor or another ISP, some transit provider, and then we set up a tunnel back to the Aaron offices. Um, over the years, we've used a lot of different methods to, to do those tunnels, from Linux boxes to VPNs to Cisco routers. Um, and all of them, well, some work better than others. I think the best way is to just use a Cisco router or a Juniper router, do a GRE tunnel. That's what we're doing at this meeting today. Um, in fact, the, uh, the router that we're using at this meeting is the router that we deployed in 2003 on the WorldCom network. It's an old Cisco 2800. I think it's a 2812. It's lived a long life, and it's pretty much done v6 the entire time. That's what it was purchased for. Um, it works really well. The other thing we've used the meeting networks for is, is a test bed for transition technologies. Uh, we're really lucky in that we get to work with our sponsors or other vendors that are interested, Comcast, ISC, um, and, and other guys, Cisco for, for their NAT-PT implementation on their routers, to try this stuff out at the meetings and see if we can get it to work. So me and my staff, I, I think I consider us lucky that we've, we've gotten to really experiment with this stuff and play with it, either before it's come out um, or before anybody's really had a chance to touch it, or even be able to go back to vendors and tell them that this works well or this doesn't. Um, a really great training opportunity for us. So how much traffic do we get? Not a whole lot, as you can see. Um, I mean, about half a percent across the board if you average it. It's not a whole lot, um, but it is there, and people miss it when it's not or when we have breakage. Um, we certainly get complaints. So there are people out there that, that, that it does matter to them that this works, and uh, it, it's really interesting seeing it grow. 